Welcome everyone to today's event, a discussion of the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, or MPI 2020. I'm James Foster, Director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, at the George Washington University, and the moderator of today's discussion on the state of global poverty, its trends, and futures prospects as seen from the holistic perspective of the MPI. I'm very happy IAEP is co-sponsoring this event with OFI, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, which is located in the Department of International Development at Oxford University. I'm also a research associate at OFI and a co-developer with Sabina Alkair of the Measurement Net Technology. This technology underlies the global MPI, but also dozens of individual country MPIs, including the national MPI for Ghana, which was just released today in Accra. The MPI is much more than a poverty measure. It's a tool for governments to coordinate ministries, to inform citizens and other stakeholders, and to hold themselves accountable. The global MPI of the UNDP and Oxford and OFI is a holistic lens for evaluating global poverty. It is also a flexible model used by countries in fashioning their own national measures that reflect national priorities. Well, now for those of you who've attended a previous IIEP event, either in the Elliott School or online, you know you can expect a lively and informative conversation on topics like the U.S. economic relations with China, urbanization and poverty, global economic governance, climate change, green finance, or digital trade. Our webinar series, Facing Inequality, is a multidisciplinary conversation on this most important of social and economic challenges, which began in April with the newest results on global inequality from Bronko Milanovic, and just yesterday had its sixth, ver sixth edition with Benjamin Braun, political economist from the Max Planck Institute discussing monetary policy and inequality. Next week, political science scientist Mita Rudra of Georgetown We'll discuss how informal workers in South Asia view international trade. Today's event follows on the heels of two big events co-sponsored with the IMF, the WIO or World Economic Outlook Report, and the Sub-Saharan African RIO or Regional Economic Report, both of which painted a rather solemn picture of what is to come. Videos from these and other events can be found on the IEP GW YouTube channel our website at iiep.gwu.edu also reports on a range of COVID-19 work being pursued by IIEP affiliates. Please have a look. Now today we have a terrific lineup of prevent presenters from OFI and the Human Development Report Office and a highly distinguished group of discussants. There are three discrete presentations, beginning with an overview of the report, continuing with a discussion of trends in the global MPI for a subset of countries, and finishing with prospects for poverty over the coming years, especially given the pandemic of COVID-19. Before each speaker and discussant, I'll provide a brief introduction. So without any further ado, let's introduce our first panel. Sabina Alkair is the director of OFI, a research center in Oxford's Department of International Development. Her long affiliation with Oxford began when she went there as a Rhodes Scholar, but she's also spent time in DC while working at the World Bank and later with GW. In addition to her prodigious research on multidimensional poverty, she's contributed to the areas of welfare economics, the capability approach, and measuring freedom and human development. She recently received the 2020 BMI Award for her groundbreaking research tackling global poverty, following in the footsteps of previous awardees, Michael Kremer and Jeffrey Sachs. Pedro Conceicao is 
the director of the Human Development Report Office of the United Nations Development Program. And he's held many other posts of importance in the UN system. Before moving to UN, he taught at the Technical University of Lisbon in Portugal and has written extensively on inequality, financing for development, and innovation and technological change. Welcome, Pedro. Ajay Chibber is Distinguished Visiting Professor here at IAEP, and he will be the discussant for Sabina and Pedro. He's also Visiting Distinguished Professor at India's National Institute for Public Finance and Policy, and Chief Economic Advisor of Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. He was the first Director General of the Independent Evaluation Office of the Government of India, and before that held senior positions at the UN as Assistant Secretary General and Assistant Administrator UNDP, and also at the World Bank. So, let's go. Sabina, are you ready? Absolutely. Great. As soon as I can share my screen. Um, the lives of the poor are an intricate balance and their steps out of poverty are even more so. Um, this year's Human Development uh, Report uh, with, with the Human Development Report Office, we are celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. And it's a delight to be able to share a little bit of those findings um, as a team. And we're very grateful to James Foster and IIEP for this uh, platform and to all of the discussants and the participants for this exchange, uh, which is our first, in a sense, in-depth presentation of, of the content. But we begin, as we must begin, with the recognition that those uh, intricate steps out of poverty are something that real people are living and that they are engaging, acting, um, and taking. And so under the human development approach, following Amartya Sen, we recognize that poor people's lives are battered and diminished in many and various ways. But we also recognize that it is their agency, their imagination, creativity, and hard work, which is, in a sense, the most important steps out of poverty as well. Uh, what we will try to do in this first presentation is give you an overview of the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index 2020 um, and also of the links to the Sustainable Development Goals. Other presenters, Monica Pinillo, Rencancio, and Ricardo will share other findings of the report related to changes over time and to projections. And I'll leave this slide in, but it's just to say that the papers and methodological notes that we are drawing on are all online. So the Multidimensional Poverty Index launched 10 years ago is a measure of acute multidimensional poverty. And this year it covers 107 developing countries and 5.9 billion people. Um, and it's our 10th year to launch the report. Uh, we understand it as complementing the dollar ninety a day measure of international poverty in the sense that it, like that measure, can be compared across countries. And it also can be disaggregated to profile uh, levels of poverty and their composition by rural and urban areas, by age group, and for 1,279 subnational regions in 98 countries. And as Pedro will share, it reflects also elements of the Sustainable Development Goals. And so this is a particularly important year because we are 10 years away from the due date of the SDGs when we are to have multidimensional poverty and to end poverty in all its forms. What is distinctive about the MPI is that it looks directly at interlinkages experienced at the level of each person. And that perhaps gives it a different resonance that I think in this first presentation, Pedro will go into more. I should simply also say that all of the country data tables are available online on both sides. Uh, websites of HDRO and of OFI, and there are additional um, trends briefings, country briefings, and interactive data banks uh, online, as well as the country do files. So if you are a student 
or if you would like a different kind of visualization, hopefully you will find there what you need. Just to review, although it's 10 years old, we uh, revised the Global MPI in 2018 to better align with the Sustainable Development Goals, and it still retains three equally weighted dimensions and 10 indicators. So you are de deprived in nutrition if any person in your household for whom we have data is undernourished. Or if a child has died in the last five years, you are deprived in child mortality. You're deprived in years of schooling if nobody has completed six years of schooling. And in school attendance, if any child in the household is not attending school up to class eight. You're deprived if you cook with solid cooking fuel you don't have adequate sanitation or it's shared. You don't have safe drinking water or have to walk 30 minutes or longer round trip to obtain it. If you lack electricity, if your roof, wall or flooring housing materials are natural or rudimentary or natural in the case of flooring. And if you don't own more than one of a small set of assets like radio, telephone, television, animal cart, bicycle, motorcycle, refrigerator, computer, and if you're deprived in a car or truck, you're not um, deprived in assets. So from these indicators, remembering that the MPI looks at linkages at the level of the person, you build a profile of the number of indicators that each person is deprived in. And then you apply the weights so that they are equally weighted across dimensions and add them up for a deprivation score. If that deprivation score shows that that person is deprived in one third or more of the indicators, they are identified as poor. From that, you can obtain the incidence of poverty, the percentage of people who are poor, and also the average deprivation score among the population, which is intensity. And the MPI is the product of those two, and it shows the percentage of possible deprivations the poor people are experiencing. So in 2020, we cover, as I said, 107 countries uh, using DHS and MIX data, demographic and health survey and multiple indicator cluster survey data for 47 countries each, PAPFAM for three, national surveys for 10. And we've updated this for 25 countries and 913 million people. The data are from 2008 to 19, but 92% of the MPI poor people living in 83 countries have data collected in 2013, 14 or later. So that's the environment and we remain very grateful to the survey providers because without good quality disaggregated data, which is even harder to come by in these days of COVID, it would be impossible to do the work that we are doing. The updated countries this year include some that have new surveys, such as Botswana or Democratic Republic of Congo or Indonesia, but also new countries such as Botswana or Cuba or Papua New Guinea. So we are very grateful to the different um, colleagues who have supported our attempts to analyze their data and answered our questions. And this work is a joint work of the Human Development Report Office um, with a team with Cecilia Calderon and at OFI's side, a team led by Ushe Kanagaratnam and Nikolai Supa. That's the team that put together these estimations of the global MPI. So what are the findings? Of those 5.9 billion people, 1.3 billion are multidimensionally poor, and 99% of them are deprived in at least three indicators, 83.5%, at least five or more indicators. So the multidimensional balance, that intricate balance of poor people is really experienced in um, the overlapping deprivations people are experiencing. And of those 1.3 billion, 1.1 billion live in rural areas, 200 million in urban, where those definitions are from national, um, taken from national definitions. Just a little bit more on where the Global MPI poor live. 84% live in South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa, similar numbers in the two. But the level of poverty, the proportion of people who are poor, is higher in Sub Saharan Africa, where on average 
it is 55%. On average in South Asia, it is 29%. But these, of course, hide a, a high variety both between countries and within countries, between subnational regions. In terms of age, half of the MPI poor people are children under the age of 18. And 100 million, 106, 7 million, are adults who are 60 years and above. An important population, again, in this time of COVID to track. But still, the sadness is that among children, one in three are multidimensionally poor, whereas among adults, it's one in six. And then in terms of the income of the countries, we primarily cover low and middle income countries. And this year, as every year, almost since we have started measuring the global MPI, two thirds of the poor people live in middle income countries, uh, which really raises a lot of questions. In middle income countries, the levels of poverty range from one to 57% at the national level and up to 91% at the subnational level. So middle income countries themselves have a great variety in terms of the levels of poverty that we'll see. So one of the value added of the global MPI for policy is that it shows not only who is poor, but how they are poor and does so in terms of each of the 10 indicators. So just to give you an idea of those 1.3 billion people who are poor, over 1 billion lack clean cooking fuel, so are at risk of acute respiratory infections, live in poor quality houses, and lack adequate sanitation. Um, over 800 million share their household with somebody who is undernourished. Um, and over 600 uh, million lack electricity, so can't turn on the light when they come home. So these are just, in a sense, the building blocks of the analyses that others will come from, come to. Um, but for every country, we have, of course, their national MPI incidence and intensity in the country briefings. We have the composition of poverty um, by indicator, and we have the level of poverty. We also look at how the deprivation scores are distributed. In this case of Indonesia, 77% of the poor have less than 40% of deprivations. And finally, we can look much more carefully at the composition of poverty at a disaggregated level. So this is Indonesia and Papua, the poorest is on the right, and Rhea Islands, the least poor on the left. And you can simply see from the colors that the composition of poverty varies a great deal, even between subnational regions with similar levels of poverty. So these are the building blocks that others will draw on. I turn now to Pedro Consensao to talk about the SDGs and the linkages of the MPI with that. Um, but I just would like to um, uh, thank James for the invitation. And I want to pick up on the point Sabina made. It's a celebratory year for us because uh, it's been 10 years since the Human Development Report uh, has started to publish the um, uh, Global Multidimensional Poverty Index based on the pathbreaking aggregation technology that Sabina and James developed, uh, which has many other uses, as uh, James has indicated, but the Human Development Report Office has consistently uh, published it. And so it's good to be here with uh, Sabina, Ricardo, Monica, members of our joint uh, OFI HDRO team, uh, but also with other friends of the Human Development Report. Um, uh, Ajay is helping us this year with a background paper. Francis is a member of our advisory board. Dean has been in our statistical advisory board. So we feel like we are in the in, in family. Now. Um, to uh, complement what uh, uh, Sabina has showed, um, let me try to share my screen, if I could. 
Uh, and Sabine has already alluded to um, the fact that part of the joint work that we uh, released this year has to do with uh, a deeper look at interlinkages uh, across the different dimensions of the multidimensional poverty index, uh, and also to look at the relationship between the the multidimensional poverty index uh, and some of the sustainable development goals. Now, in terms of um, the sustainable development goals, the report covers a number of them. I'll just provide a, a quick glimpse of some of the analysis contained in the report by looking at some of the results linked to uh, uh, education, uh, health, uh, rural urban divide, and uh, uh, the, wor the world of, of, of work. Uh, but before that, let me make a quick point on interlinkages. Sabine already mentioned that uh, uh, over 80% of the 1.3 billion people living in multidimensional poverty are deprived in at least five dimensions. But another striking um, finding of our report is that over 71% of the 5.1 billion people covered are deprived in at least one dimension. And one of the advantages of the MPI, in my view, is this ability of enabling us to look at the joint distribution of the privations uh, and also at looking at the way in which sometimes they, they intersect. So what this graph shows is for each of the 10 dimensions that we consider in the MPI, uh, the number of the privations uh, uh, that occur, for instance, in nutrition, if that are exclusive to nutrition, which is the first bar, this means that 20% of those are only deprived in nutrition. And you see how the number of uh, deprivations, the percentage of people uh, deprived in other uh, dimensions. So this is a count of the number of deprivations. Uh, and uh, just to contrast, uh, if we look at electricity, for instance, over 90, 98% of people that are deprived in, in, in electricity are deprived also in other dimensions. So this shows the power of looking under the hood of the multidimensional poverty index that enables us to see the way in which uh, deprivations often uh, uh, are overlapped and overlaid with, with one another. And uh, now to move to the analysis uh, of the SDGs, uh, what we find consistently is the kind of gradients that we see reflected here in this chart. So this shows uh, the percentage uh, of, uh, 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 of people uh, that have received um, a diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis uh, vaccine, um, with the red bar indicating those that live in uh, uh, multidimensional poverty, uh, the orange bar, people vulnerable, and the uh, blue bar, people uh, not in poverty. And you see that for every country, there is this gradient with the percentage decreasing as uh, you move towards not being uh, in poverty. So this should suggest the kind of um, analysis that might be relevant for policymakers, in this case, uh, looking at uh, health-related issues and specifically vaccination in this case. Now, you see the same gradients when it comes to um, education. Uh, here, we have the number of years, so the higher the bar, the, the better. Uh, and actually, the red bar here, the first bar, uh, uh, looks at people not being in uh, uh, multidimensional poverty. Uh, and and you, as you move to, towards the right, uh, you, you see that the number uh, of, of, of years in years of schooling comes down. And we also have a breakdown between not only women and men, uh, but also between people living in urban and rural areas for its gender. Uh, and you see that the bars are higher for um, men as compared to, to women, and also uh, higher for those living in urban areas in each group compared to those living in rural areas. So this feature of gradients uh, on different dimensions of the SDGs are um, uh, clear clearly revealed by uh, the information that we use to compute the MPI and are, in my view, extremely relevant for the concept of leaving no one behind because it clearly shows that on several of the SDG dimensions, as this gradient suggests, many people living in multidimensional poverty are actually being left behind in a number of dimensions uh, contemplated in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. 
Now, Sabine has already alluded to the fact that the multidimensional poverty index, uh, as of now, captures a huge number of people living uh, um, in rural areas uh, as being multidimensionally poor. Uh, and I think this can be read in, in two ways. One is that actually uh, we have um, an overrepresentation of multidimensional, uh, multidimensionally poor people living in rural areas, which is certainly uh, possible and certainly the case. But I think it may also be read as um, the currently MPI uh, suggesting that it captures or is geared to capturing particularly well multidimensional poverty in um, uh, in rural areas. So as we think uh, as uh, 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 of the improvements uh, that we may uh, consider doing as we look forward on on, on the MPI, we may uh, uh, consider whether it's uh, possible uh, using the information that we have available. To capture better the uh, the number of people or those living in multidimensional poverty, also in, in urban areas. Um, just to give an example, uh, uh, access to drinking water, for instance, uh, now implies that people uh, um, uh, that walk up to thirty minutes back and forth to to get water are considered multidimensionally poor. But perhaps in a urban area. Um, that might not be a, a condition that speaks to the deprivation of not having access to um, uh, drinking water. And we have to find this, the, the right balance here uh, because uh, uh, the experience, uh, the, the living lived uh, experience of having to walk 30 minutes to access water is obviously very different than the one of someone living in an urban area that can access water much more quickly. But this is the kind of uh, reflections that I think we need to make as we as we look forward. And again, it would be good to have um, the views of uh, our discussions on, on this point. Uh, I'll, I'll conclude with the analysis that we did on, on the world of work. Uh, the MPI currently does not have direct indicators uh, of um, what happens in terms of employment or, or, or the nature of, um, of work. But we, we find it interesting to see that there is an association between multidimensional poverty uh, and child labor, uh, which uh, was again, even though we don't measure it directly, it may suggest that um, child labor is certainly associated with the higher levels of, of multidimensional, poverty, uh, multidimensional poverty. So even when it's not possible to directly observe uh, some of the indicators that speak to the, to the SDGs, through these kind of associations, and we have a number of them uh, in the report, um, uh, it's possible to draw inferences that can help us to understand the connections between multidimensional poverty, uh, multidimensional poverty, and the SDGs. So let me stop here, and I guess back to James. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much, Pedro. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn it right over to our good friend, Mr. Chibber. Oh, okay. And thank you so much for to this distinguished panel. And um, I've never met uh, Sabina, but I've heard so much about her, including from you, James. Um, so it's a pleasure to be able to see her and comment on this. And of course, uh, my good friend, Pedro, former colleague. Uh, I must tell Pedro that he's looking even younger than I remember him. So despite all the hard work that he's doing, um, something good is happening. And also he's doing a great job with the HDRO. So I I'm, uh, congratulate to him and wonderful to see him. Can you hear me, James? You're doing Hello? great. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, on to the report. Um, first, I must admit that I am a big fan of uh, the multidimensional poverty index. When I was in the UNDP heading the Asia Bureau, I would go to every country in Asia and ask them whether they were calculating the multidimensional poverty index or not. And uh, where they were, I would congratulate them, but where they were not, I would urge them to do so. And when I moved to India as the first Director General of Independent Evaluation, 
I was asked to assess these central schemes. We, India has a lot of these centralized schemes. And the first question that came to my mind was, in such a diverse country with so many differences in deprivations in different parts of the country, how could these centralized schemes work? And I tried to urge the government to take up multidimensional poverty indicators. Unfortunately, at that time, the Poverty Commission was headed by a very conservative central banker, who I will not name, and it didn't work. But I'm told now the new government of India has adopted multidimensional poverty indicators. So I'm very happy to hear that, that it's spread to India as well. Now, um, I may tread on some uh, later commentators, but let me quickly go through these slides. I think one thing that comes out from the, 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 the report and the data there is, of course, that the first two decades of this uh, century have seen very huge um, reduction in poverty. And despite the global financial uh, recession, uh, which came sort of halfway through that march on poverty uh, of poverty re uh, reduction, of course, with a few countries that are still uh, uh, struggling with it, but for a very large number of countries, that has been this relentless uh, uh, march for poverty reduction. And uh, in Asia itself, when I was at UNDP, we did a big study across about 25, 30 countries with surveys to see what happened after that global financial crisis. And of course, the recovery was very swift. Uh, the social recovery was much slower, but nevertheless, it was a temporary slowdown. And of course, Francis Stewart, who will be talking later, has this uh, uh, global study sh showing how temporary that slow slowdown in poverty reduction was. And you can see on the slide some of the factors that uh, created that situation um, and as to why, um, you know, there was a, a blip, but then poverty reduction marched on very quickly. Now we come to, of course, COVID. And the question, of course, becomes, will we see that kind of temporary slowdown or do we expect to see uh, something more significant. And of course, the report itself has these two very intriguing stories about uh, Sierra Leone with Ebola, uh, and then the London World War II, uh, where life expectancy goes up. Uh, I, and actually, I was looking for more, um, more out of these stories on whether they would be giving us some pointers on which way to go. Of course, the London story could be that if you provided uh, more ration targeted food uh, to people, that would be one factor. But anyway, I, you know, I was intrigued by those. Now, uh, the report itself says that there will be a huge reduction, a huge increase in poverty, that this progress that we have seen will be reversed to a considerable extent in one scenario. 9.2 years and to uh, sort of still a significant extent, five point some years in the median scenario. Um, I just compared this to all the other uh, indicators that we have of what is likely to be the effect of COVID on poverty. And you have a huge range out there. Some of the earlier models, the IFRI model and the ILO model that use CGE, modeling, they show the lowest numbers. The World Bank's official numbers are still significantly lower than what the MDPI is showing. Uh, and even uh, at $3.2 per day, which is at their highest number with inequality, they're showing a number of 176 million. The UNU wider has numbers comparable to uh, what is shown in the MDPI report but I'm sure you'll talk more about it. But I just wanted to point out that the numbers in the report for projections are on the high side. Uh, and um, 
compared to all the other stuff that we are seeing out there. So there might be some story there that you might want to look at as well. Now, uh, one of the questions comes every time we have these shocks, uh, how come we are not able to, uh, you know, not predict, but at least ex ante assess how vulnerable are these improvements in poverty eradication to these shocks? Now, uh, for Pedro mentioned this background paper that I've done for the this year's HDRO uh, HDR report. In that, I explore this uh, concept of vulnerability to to poverty or vulnerability to shocks, which draws from uh, Professor Amartya Sen's writings, of course, and. James Foster himself has done some very interesting work on this. And, and what I tried to do there was to show that vulnerability, you could create a vulnerability adjusted human development index, that its results would be somewhat dissimilar from the inequality adjusted human development index. Uh, and I won't go, given time, I won't go into too much detail, but it does come back to what Pedro was saying that, you know, there are uh, ways to navigate the data to assess more vulnerability to um, uh, poverty uh, and whether those could be indicators of how policy has to adjust to reduce that kind of uh, vulnerability. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really congratulate you on this uh, report, but I must say that the um, uh, in a way, MD, the multidimensional poverty is tailor made for assessing m with much greater texture and detail how policies and programs might affect uh, deprivations. In some cases, it's quite straightforward. I mean, when you talk about, say, housing or cooking fuel or things like that. But when it comes to things like health and uh, and uh, and uh, e even education, I think uh, we need to be able to use this data in a in much more the textured data and the database that you have in, in more significant ways to assess. Uh, you know, how uh, combinations of policies would affect certain outcomes. I saw the f uh, uh, focus on children and on the elderly. I was missing, uh, maybe it was in some of your earlier reports, but I would have thought gender would be an obvious uh, demographic that you would look at. Uh, especially now as with this COVID uh, uh, pandemic, women are much more likely to be affected. They are home care providers, much more dependent on informal jobs. You know, the, the, the whole intra-household effects, I think, could be, could be much more explored. Perhaps you had it in a previous report. I missed it because I, 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 I learned a lot from what you did on the youth and on the elderly, but I, I thought, well, the obvious one was 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 gender, and that seemed to be missing here. Um, and also, there was a very heavy focus on rural and urban, but in some way, it sort of begs the question: you know, what 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 is the policy implication of that? Do you do more in the rural areas? Do you move people out of rural areas? Uh, when I was at the World Bank, I was for five, six years, the World Bank director in Turkey, and I lived in Turkey. And what became very clear to me was that the biggest improvements in health, sanitation, education in Turkey actually came about from migration into Geche Kondo, what they call these illegal settlements around the big cities, which then become a vote bank, and then the local mayor has to provide them all kinds of uh, services in health or water and education, et cetera. So, you know, what are the implications of these very stark findings that you have between rural and urban areas, et cetera? Uh, and uh, so what I'm saying is, I mean, following uh, James Heckman, uh, 
uh, whose work I am a great admirer of. I think more of this cost benefit style analysis will have to be done using this very rich database that you have uh, to, to guide us uh, forward in the future. And especially in this link to the SDGs to bring about this synergy of, of or combination of things that has to happen to lead to certain outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ajay. Um, would you like a chance to respond, Pedro or Sabina? Okay, well, thank you so much um, for those wonderful comments, reflections. And I think I would really agree very much that this is the tip of the iceberg, that a lot more needs to be done to tease out the policy implications, a lot more detailed work. One of the frustrations of doing something that's global is that you're also sitting on so much textured country, intra-country details. Um, but they can't be be drawn out in, in a quick way. But I think that that also requires a second step of analysis. And that analysis requires a, you know, the specific understanding of the policy drivers and the, and the situations, the institutions, and the data sources um, in each country. And I very much hope that this year, with the trends that Monica will pre present next, um, that this, that will catalyze a greater engagement to find out those policy lessons. And we would very much from our side at OFI uh, welcome that. On gender, very much I agree that that is a, a key aspect. Three things. First of all, um, we hope next year that we will be able to um, have gendered analyses insofar as the global MPI permits. So the global MPI is focused on household level data. But in the indicators, for example, of um, schooling, we'll be able to see how many households have a woman who has not, not completed six years of schooling, for example, or another level of schooling. Last year, in the global MPI report that HDRO and OFI released together, we did have a gendered and intra-household study of children uh, for South Asia, where we were able to see not only what were the levels of malnutrition, but who in terms of the children in a household were undernourished? At what age? How many boys, how many girls? Um, were all the children in the household who are under the age of five undernourished or not? And similar with out of school, were all the boys and girls in a, in a household out of school or which were out of school? And um, that's, I think, a, a step forward. If we are able to do that next year at a global level, then it'll mean that all of that intra-household details that we are able to have access to in these 10 indicators will be made available. Um, again, it will require another step of analysis, but we are fascinated and wanting to unhook that. And the last point is to say that we do have some things like female-headed households, and we can disaggregate, in a sense, by those and very much hope to in the coming year as well. So point taken that it's not this focus on gender that we would like um, this year, uh, that there are are some methodological investigations going forward in terms of what we can do to make sure that always household multidimensional poverty measures are accompanied by intra-household and gendered analyses of the indicators that permit. And uh, yeah, and the findings that come out are very interesting. So uh, we're happy to share the South Asia report with people or the South Asia paper, which is on the OFI working site um, with those some of those results if they are of interest. Thank you, and over to Pedro. Thank you, Sabina. Very briefly uh, on um, gender and rural urban. Uh, so Sabina has already mentioned last year, we did look a little bit into gender agile. So um, we'll share the study that we jointly produced last year with you. Uh, but there are two um, recent findings that uh, I think are important to help us to think through the um, gender uh, poverty aspects. One is what Martin Ravalian documented that for Sub-Saharan Africa, three quarters of undernourished girls and underweight women, three quarters, are not in the 20% income poor people. So this suggests, as you were indicating, Ajay, that intra-household dynamics uh, and uh, biases against women and girls is actually pervasive. 
not only uh, within those living in, in, in poverty, but actually across uh, the distribution. Uh, and secondly, I think it's very important also to look along the life cycle. That's why this focus on, on children that Sabina mentioned that we started doing last year is so important. For instance, uh, Carolina's team uh, at the World Bank has documented that actually the difference in poverty between uh, men and women, girls and boys, is not constant across the life cycle. So between zero and five, there's actually higher poverty for girls compared to boys. Then the curves sort of converge between five and 20 years of age. Between 20 and 35, they widen again. So poverty for women from 20 to 35 is higher than for men. And then they converge after 35. So understanding what happens along the life cycle, I think is very important, uh, uh, not only analytically, but also to inform policy, because I, I, I worry that sometimes there are blanket statements made there, for instance, the zombie statistic that 70% of people living in poverty are women, that is really not based on, on facts. And I think we need a much finer grain analysis of the gender dimensions of, of poverty. Uh, and on rural urban, uh, I think the points you, you make are well taken, so fine. Many people uh, that are poor live in rural areas, so so what? So what's the policy recommendation? Fair question. Uh, but I would also add, um, and this is more for, for our teams to reflect upon and to take forward as a research agenda, whether the, the, the way in which the MPI is currently defined and constructed uh, tends to measure more accurately poverty in rural than in urban areas. So this is a reflection that we need to, uh, to undertake because there might be also an element of the way in which the MPI is currently defined that may uh, lead to an overrepresentation of um, rural poverty. Uh, but Ajay, wonderful comments. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, and looking forward to the continuation of the discussion and dialogue. Well, I'm going to throw in two brief questions here, if you don't mind, from Sadia Siddiqui. Uh, lower middle income countries, which make up 60% of the multidimensionally poor, does this indicate inequality or growth of inequality in these countries? And second, how can the MPI indicators be connected to the emergency social protection programs that have launched during this pandemic? Either of you? So thank you very much for the questions. And Pedro, you can compliment as well. Last year, our, our joint report focused exactly on illuminating inequalities. And particularly what was important was looking at the inequalities within low, lower middle and upper middle income countries at the subnational regions. And as I said, in, in middle income countries, this year it goes again from zero to 91% in terms of the range of subnational levels of poverty. And so it's certainly in the kind of inequality that we are measuring, which is inequality in the level of poverty, that is certainly visible. Um, how that maps on to economic inequality measured by the Gini or by some other inequality measure or standard um, is, is still um, not direct, as we also showed in that report. There's not a direct um, relationship or association between the Gini coefficient and the level of MPI at a national level. Um, in terms of the emergency COVID response and the MPI, there are a number of intersections and we could talk a lot about this because our team at OFI have been working quite extensively and others on my team could talk very well as well. But three quick things. One is that some of the indicators of the MPI directly relate to vulnerability that if a person contracts COVID, it would have an unfortunate outcome, such as nutrition, lack of clean water, and cooking fuel. And using the 2019 statistics, they're not yet updated for 2020, we found that 485 million had all three of those at the same time, and 355 million of them were poor. And then we mapped that subnationally, we mapped that against the COVID um, incidents and the COVID fatalities for the different regions. So that's one point of purchase. A second is that the MPI can be augmented by indicators of overcrowding, uh, not having a good place for hand washing, 
or an intergenerational household or the presence of an old person or a person with asthma or diabetes or a chronic health condition that would be particularly susceptible to COVID. And that means augmenting the global MPI um, by some of these indicators. And again, a, another work in progress has, has done that to bring all these indicators into the same environment and identify particularly vulnerable people. We also recognize that the MPI does not capture informal work um, and other conditions that we really recognize are as important. And so it's not a sufficient tool for the pandemic. What are governments doing? Some, for example, in the case of Colombia, got permission to fold their health records data and their census-based MPI data together. And so they could have a joined up picture and do a government response using their national MPI. Other governments have used a global MPI or uh, a similar measure to identify and target groups that by this augmented vulnerability index are most at risk. So that's just a, a little surface of a much larger response and set of work. James, let me just uh, quickly uh, complement. I'll be very brief, but first I need to make a correction. Uh, Dean has helped me to clarify that the work on gender that I quoted uh, is actually uh, led by Karen uh, uh, Grown's team at the World Bank. Uh, so uh, just um, a correction. Um, just to, on both inequality and, and social protection, the, the point I would make complementing Sabina's is the MPI is really crucial because it takes us beyond the discussions on income. So uh, the report, Human Development Report last year, uh, looked at inequalities beyond income. So considering income, but beyond income. So uh, I think it's important to look at inequalities, not only in income and wealth, but in many other dimensions. And the work that we did on inequality last year was a first step in that direction. And similarly on social protection, uh, I think that uh, income transfers certainly play a role, but with the MPI, as Sabine indicated, we have a much finer grain to understand more clearly where are the vulnerabilities, what are the deprivations, and how to target policies in ways that actually speak to what people are, are going through. Because in many cases, we know that markets don't work, prices are highly distorted, and uh, uh, you know, just a transfer, an income transfer might not uh, be the best solution in every case. So it calls for a broader understanding uh, of uh, uh, social protection intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. So to our second session. On trends in global MPI, next speaker is Monica Pineda. Uh, Ron Cancio, who's a co-director of Metrics and Policy at OFI and coordinates their work for Latin America, East Asia, and a number of other countries. Before coming to OFI, she was a professor at the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia and has published extensively in the areas of disability, multidimensional poverty, and health. She has her doctorate from the University of Birmingham in uh, social policy, and following her, the discussant will be Frances Stewart, Professor Emeritus of Development Economics at Oxford, where she was Director of the Department of International Development and Director of the Center for Research on Inequality, Human Security, and Ethnicity. Her honors and research contributions are far too numerous to mention, but I will mention her honorary doctorate from the University of Sussex and her pathbreaking work on horizontal inequalities and conflict. So I'll turn it over to you, Monica. Thank you very much, James, and thank you everyone for the invitation. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here representing a whole team that was working in changes over time in the analysis of the global MPI. And um, so first of all, I just want to explain really briefly what do we do when we are analyzing changes over time and what is the approach that we have analyzing the data. So the first thing that we do is to find a country that has data that allows the calculation of the computation of the global MPI for two years and we harmonize the indicators in order that we are sure that the indicators are measuring the same concept. 
or at least we are as sure as we can do, uh, we can be. Also, we make sure that the sampling frame of the two surveys are comparable, because at the end, what we want to do is to compare how the property has changed across two years in the same country. And that's the main goal of this uh, process of harmonization. Because of that, we compute a harmonized MPI, and this harmonized MPI sometimes is different that the, uh, the um, standardized MPI that we can find. And these differences are given by cause of that, because we are uh, prioritizing the comparison before two years in, the in time. Once we have computed the MPI, the incidence, and the intensity, we are going to analyze the changes in the incidence, intensity, and the MPI. Also, the changes in the unsensored and sensory headcount ratio, so the percentage of people who are the private initial in the indicator uh, across the both years, and also the percentage of people who are the private initial indicator and also are multidimensionally poor. And um, we analyze relative and absolute changes that I'm going to really briefly explain what, are, what those are and um, analyze the number of poor people or the, the reductions in the number of poor people per country. So when, we, when I say about the absolute and relative uh, changes, why those are so important for us and why we compute both? And we compute the absolute relative, uh, the absolute change, because it will allow us to compare the difference between year A and year B. So it's, a, it's just a difference. But the relative change also shows this as a percentage of the initial period. So it allows us to analyze little changes and how those little changes can be related with the initial period. We need both because what we see is that in countries that have a high levels of poverty, the absolute change are quite good. But uh, in the countries that have low levels of poverty, what we see is that the reduction of poverty it becomes more and more, more difficult. And if we only analyze the absolute change, the, the numbers are going to be really small, but a small number in a number that is quite small at the beginning can be a large uh, percentage. So for us, it's really important to understand what is happening in those uh, changes and in the MPI, in the incidence and the intensity. And another thing that is important for us is not only to analyze the absolute and the relative change, but to analyze how these changes are uh, every year. So we analyze, uh, analyze the, the absolute and the relative changes. And in this, in the only thing that we do is just to control for the space between year one and year two, or the difference between year one and year two. And this allows us to know more or less how was the change per year. And in here, it's really important to keep this in mind because when we are including the countries, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the sample on the countries that we have included. Uh, we include countries in periods of, the, of years. So we have countries that have three or four or five or 12 years of difference between the sample or the survey one and the summer two, survey 12. And for us, it's really important to know how, how much was the change every year. So the next thing, is to start talking about what we did this year. This year was the, um, the first time that OFI published a large set uh, of countries, and we published this uh, um, in the Human Development Report of, uh, with the collaboration of the Human uh, uh, HDRO. And in here, we include 75 countries. It's the first time that we include this large number of countries before we have included less, and we have analyzed less. Um, Less countries, and in here we have that we include uh, countries from different regions of all, for an all developed uh, developing regions in the world, uh, with the largest number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa with 35. We have 12 countries in Europe and Central Asia, and 12 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, the lowest number of countries was four uh, in South Asia. These uh, 75 countries cover around the five billion people around the world, so we. We are quite happy to say that this um, analysis covers a, a large uh, percentage of the population around the world, and we can analyze what has happened in the levels of poverty. So, when we are started analyzing uh, and I started all the study, we find that there are countries, and if you go and see the tables, uh, at the table number two in the report, and also uh, in the web page in the Adofi, we have a, a table six that includes all the, the data and the results that I'm going to present now. And one of the things that you will find, as I was mentioning before, is that we have countries that have difference between uh, both between year one and year two of three years, as is in the case of um, 
uh, Ghana, um, yeah, this is in the case of um, of Ghana, and also uh, we have countries that have differences between uh, uh, survey one and survey two of 12 years, as is in the case of uh, Central Africa or Gabon, that we have like large difference. And this large difference is because we, as, as I was mentioned before, we really want to harmonize and be as strict as we can in order to be able to say something and we need services that are quite comparable, like completely comparable. So the oldest data that we have is data from 2000 uh, from Central African Republic and Gabon. And the new, uh, latest uh, data was uh, data from Bangladesh. We also have data uh, from 2018 from countries such as Peru. And we have included uh, country, uh, data from uh, so that most of the data is from 2010 to 2019. We most of the time use MIX and DHS. In some cases, we use national surveys that, as I mentioned, we are able to say that we are, uh, com are comparable sources. And um, we try to harmonize, we do all the harmonization process, as I was mentioned before. So the results of the analysis include that we have 75 con of the 75 countries, we have 65 countries that reduces their MPI in absolute terms and 62 in relative terms. And those differences were significant. In the cases of Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Liberia, we found that, the that those three countries had the largest or the fastest reduction in the absolute terms. And in the case of North Macedonia, uh, China, and Armenia, the these three countries had the largest, the fastest reduction in multidimensional poverty in relative terms. When we analyze the countries uh, that reduce by half the levels of multidimensional poverty in the periods that we were able to analyze the data, we find that four countries were able to achieve this goal. And those were Armenia, India, Nicaragua, and North Macedonia. And India was a country that reduced the largest percentage or the largest number of poor people. It include, um, the, the reduction in poor people was uh, in the number of poor people or living in multidimensional poverty was approximately by 270 million. And this is, a, is the country, as I mentioned, um, that reduces the largest number of poor. So one other thing that we did and that was really important for us was not only to analyze uh, multidimensional poverty and to analyze how this multidimensional poverty was uh, in each of the countries, but we also uh, contrast this reduction with the reduction that has been seen in the same period of time with income poverty. And we found that the 52 of the 71 countries that we were able to do this analysis reduce multidimensional poverty and uh, or that the reduction in multidimensional poverty was faster in absolute terms compared with the reduction in, in income poverty. And we can see in here in this um, um, image that, you, uh, that that reduction, that even though the countries like Sierra Leone have seen reduction in multidimensional poverty and income poverty, both are not completely the same. And we also see in the case of Zimbabwe, for example, that they go in different directions. That in the in the case of Zimbabwe, they increase, there was an increase in the in the number of people or in the percentage of people who were income poor in the same period, but there was a reduction in the percentage of people who were multidimensional poor. And this means that it's necessary to analyze both types, both types of poverty in order to give a completely a more accurate overview of the situation of poverty in a country. And this becomes really fundamental. And I will talk a little bit more about how we can triangulate or we have, how we have triangulated these different data sources in, in the paper, in the research progress that is available in the off web page. Additionally, to just analyzing the incidence of the reduction in the incidence and the intensity and the MPI, we also focus on analyzing which are those indicators that can or that have been reduced the most in each of the countries. So in here we have that Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Liberia that were the countries that reduced 
the, uh, the facet in absolute terms, have different compositions of the different uh, of the uh, of the indicators that contributed to that reduction. In the case of Sierra Leone, that is the red bar, what you will see is that the reduction was uh, the largest in the indicators in nutrition, cooking fuel, sanitation, housing. But in the case of Liberia, that is a, a blue line, you will see that the reduction was largest in the case of uh, the indicators related to the school attendance and asset. And Mauritania, that is the orange bar, had the largest reduction in years of schooling. This means that when you are analyzing the reduction of the changes over time in one country, it's really, really important to open the MPI, that is like to use that the, um, disaggregation uh, property and analyze which indicators are there and how they are contributing, how you are reducing those deprivations to understand how these uh, different strategies or different things that countries have done have uh, aimed or have reduced and helped in the reduction of multidimensional poverty. And, and this is really informative for us as a researcher, but also for policymakers. And in this context, I would like to talk a little bit about the case of India. India is, a, as, a, as I mentioned, is a country that reduces the largest uh, number of people that were multidimensional poor in the years that we were analyzing, that it was 2005, 2005, 6, and 2006, to 2015 and 2016. In this, both, in this, between those years, what we saw is that there was a reduction in the percentage of, um, or in the incidence of multidimensional poverty from 55.1 to 27.9. And this reduction means that in, in um, absolute terms, every year there was a reduction of 2.7% of the incidence of multidimensional poverty. Also, it's important in here to consider that we have a reduction uh, in the intensity of multidimensional poverty as well, from, um, from 51 to uh, 43.9. And here in the graph, you can see that there was a reduction in in all the indicators, but the indicators that contributed the most, the indicators that have the largest reduction, were those related with nutrition and living standards that are in blue. And if we move to analyze the subregions, what we see is that all the subregions have a reduction, but those who were the poorest, that are the here in this corner, are were the ones who uh, reduce it the most over the time. So we are leaving, not leaving anyone behind because we are helping those who are poor to get out of poverty, but also we are helping those who are the poorest to uh, start reducing their deprivations. So finally, um, I'm going to finish with this uh, analysis that is, an, is one of the most interesting, or uh, one interesting thing that we included in the paper and, is, and we're working on this, is about the triangulation between the monetary and non-monetary poverty trends following uh, the Atkinson uh, book of uh, global, um, multi global poverty. And in here, what we did is that we use eight indicators when analyzing eight different measures of poverty in order to understand the natural of poverty trends and the relationship between these measures. And these, you will find the results, the detailed results in the research in progress uh, 57 in the web page of OFI. And once we analyze, we, once we include all these, what we did was to analyze the direction, the slope, and the initial poverty levels, and the levels of destitution, or what happened with the levels of destitution, vulnerability, and severity of the uh, multidimensional poverty. And what we found is that only three countries have multidimensional poverty trends that are different in the direction compared to the monetary uh, trends. And those countries were Albania, Uganda, and Yemen. When we analyzed the slope and the initial poverty levels, we, th we found that although often the direction of the poverty trends follows the same between monetary and non-monetary, as, as quite similar, what we see is that the slope and the initial levels are quite different. And the difference are given by different factors that we uh, try to analyze in the in a specific cases. And the finally, when we analyze the institution vulnerability and severity, understanding that severity is um, um, like a, a, a people who are deprived in not only in 33% of the global MPI, but in 55% uh, of the global MPI, we found that 
people are uh, reducing the situation severity is reducing but the vulnerability is increasing or it hasn't moved and here to finalize that i have seen jane <laughs> i can see jane <laughs> uh, what i want to show in here is one example and um, you will find uh, all the information and similar graphs for all the countries in the web page what we can see in here is that when we analyze here we see that there are difference or there are movements in the global um, indicators or in the multidimensional indicators that are these uh, lines in here but in the vulnerability we see an increase so this um, this also calls our attention to find that maybe not only moving people outside the poverty line but also pay a lot of attention to those who are really close to the poverty line thank you very much thank you so much monica francis Francis has unfortunately um, been booted off of the WebEx. We are working on rejoining her, um, but it may take a few minutes. No problem. Then we'll go on, and when she's returned, we'll fit her in at times when it makes sense. Great. Well, uh, let's continue now to the next panel. Uh, those of you who have questions, what we'll do is we'll let you think of those questions and we'll come back at the end with questions for the previous panel. But for the final panel, let's go to Ricardo Nogales, who's a research associate at a uh, research office, that officer that is, I'm so sorry, with OFI, responsible for work on the global MPI and multi-dimensional multi, uh, Poverty Indices for Nations. Before that, he was a professor at Universidad uh, Privada Boliviana in Bolivia. He's worked on a broad array of research topics, including poverty, mobility, and human capabilities and climate change with numerous grants from Inter-American Development Bank, IDRC, UNDP, and the ILO. He has a doctorate from the University of Geneva in econometrics. His discussant is Dean Jolliffe, who is lead economist in the global poverty team at the Indicators and Data Services Unit and in the Living Standards Measurement Study Team of the Data Produ Production and Methods Unit of the Data Group at the World Bank. Before that, he was with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, taught in Prague, Czech Republic, and at Princeton, and has published extensively in the areas of poverty, inequality, education, health, household labor supply, and related measurement issues. So if we don't have uh, Francis back, let us continue. Ricardo. Thank you very much, James. And thank you to all the team at IEP for the invitation. This is a very special occasion for us because it is going to be the first time that we will be able to share some more technical details about the projections and uh, the, co the effects of COVID-19 that we uh, feature in the report. So this is joint work with uh, Sabina Natalie Quinn, who's also in the panel, and Nicolai Siupa. And I do invite you to read the Research in Progress uh, paper, number 58, that it's available at our website. Um, because, I, because, of the, because of time, I will only have uh, a short amount of, of, of time to just skim uh, around some important aspects of this uh, work. So basically, uh, our projections work uh, is based uh, is based first of all on the very comprehensive data set that Monica has just described, and it is aimed at answering this particular question: Which countries are on track to have multidimensional poverty between 2015 and 2030? So essentially, I am just going to describe not only the results that we have, but also how we arrive at those results. So our strategy consists of calibrating models for the trajectories of multidimensional poverty, poverty in the uh, incidence H and uh, intensity A, and then did use the trajectories of MPI in order to ensure its consistency all across the time period that we analyze. We build upon similar studies that have attempted, attempted similar exercises with other development indicators, such as, the such as child mortality, for example, or school completion. And essentially, we consider three models a linear model, a constant relative change, and a logistic model. And among those three, the logistic model is the one that enjoys uh, a good support from cost country evidence, as I will describe now. So 
here, for example, I show, uh, I'm just going to focus on the first panel that I have here, the one in the right, on the left. So here I plot the change that we observe in H in the two periods of time for which we have data against the initial level of H uh, for each country. And analyzing or uh, trying to identify the function that associates this change with the level of, uh, of H uh, amounts precisely to identifying the differential equation that characterizes the level of H at different points in time. So essentially, if these data points, for example, were to be represented on average by a linear model, then we would have a horizontal line as a good representation of them. If, however, we find that a monotonically decreasing line is a better representation for those data points, then we would have evidence in favor of a cross, uh, sorry, of a um, constant relative change model. But if we have a quadratic form that it's better these data points, then we would have evidence in favor of a logistic model. So basically what we try to do is try to uncover what is the, fun the functional form for those differential equations. We do that for H and we do that for A, and then we use this identity that is very important in order to respect and to ensure that MPI is consistently computed all across our analysis. So MPI is always computed as H times A. Very briefly, these are the models that we can, some of the models that we consider for H. You will immediately see, for example, that if we postulate a linear function to model the, the change of H over time, then we would get a very poor fit, and that that fit would increase considerably if we include a quadratic term in the equation, including other more complicated or more complex functional forms, polynomial functions of H, for example, or A and interactions of H and A, would actually, um, we will actually arrive at uh, milder uh, increases in terms of adjustment and uh, normally including some terms that are in the end non-significant to explain the movement of H over time. But more importantly, one very uh, distinctive characteristic of this model, the one that includes a linear and a quadratic regressor uh, of H, is that uh, actually we can, we, we fail to reject the fact that this estimates that we find here are actually empirical counterparts of the structural equation that we have here, which is the, precisely the differential equation that corresponds to a logistic model. That is why in the report we defend that the logistic model enjoys very good support from our cross-country data. And at the same time, we perform a similar analysis for the trajectory of A. Again, we start with a simple model where the changes in A are postulated to be explained by only linear, a linear form of A, and we find a very poor fit. And then by adding a quadratic term, we also, in, we also arrive at a better fit. And compared to other possible models, again, it is very distinctive to find that this model that we have here, that includes a linear and a quadratic term in A and a constant, Actually, we fail to reject the hypothesis that these estimates that we have here are simply empirical counterparts of the structural form of movement of A that is reflected by this equation. This is important because this equation precisely corresponds to the first, uh, to the, 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 the differential equation of a transformed logistic model. Transformed in what sense? Well, the logistic model uh, allows the variable to move between one and uh, zero, so it's bounded between zero and one. But as we know by definition, A can only be bounded between uh, one and one third, because by construction, we can never observe in reality a value of A that is lower than one third. So that is taken into account as well in this transform logistic function. Now, once we set the functional forms for the trajectories of A and H, then we apply the two points that we have for each country to calibrate those trajectories. Here I plot the example of India, where you see that H, which is the, the green line here, um, is calibrated using those two data points. We do the same thing for A, and then we always deduce MPI as the product of H times A to ensure consistency. And basically what we do is uh, we apply this procedure to every country, each of the 75 that we have in the data set. And we find the following results, which are highlighted in the report. Among the 75 countries that we analyze, we find that 47 of them are on track to have multidimensional poverty by this graph. So in this graph, the top end of the red line represents the projected level of MPI in 2015. 
for each country. And the red dot represents the projected value of NPI in 2030 for each country. The horizontal dash that we have here that varies by country is um, the goal, so the targets. So it represents half of the top end of the red line, if you want. So whenever this line crosses that target, then we assume that it meets the target. And for completeness, we, we do that not only for our preferred model, which is the logistic model, but also for the other candidates, which are the linear uh, model and the constant relative change model. 47 of those countries would actually meet the target irrespective of the model that we choose among the three of them. In that sense, we call those results as model robust because they survive and the qualitative result is identical no matter what functional form we take among the three that we consider. Similarly, we find that 18 countries out of the 75 that we consider are robustly, quote unquote, off track uh, to meet the target because they never um, cross the, the target, if you want. They never, they never arrive at having poverty um, by any of the models that we consider. And then we have a set of 10 countries that are in the middle in the sense that they would meet the target, but that would be model dependent. Uh, so it depends on what model you trust to represent the trajectory. So, of course, all of these results are only possible now because we have that comprehensive set of, 20, of 75 countries for which we have at least two data points. But of course, all the results that I've presented now are uh, not taking into account the current pandemic that is, uh, that is uh, ongoing. And uh, of course, we don't have real world data to perform an exact evaluation of the effects of COVID uh, on MPI as of yet. So that is why we resort to um, simulation exercises. For that, we concentrate on two, on two indicators of the MPI. We, have, uh, we scrutinize the effects on school attendance and the effects on nutrition. To analyze the effects on school attendance, we draw on data by UNESCO, and we explore what would happen if 50% of the primary school age children who are currently attending school see that situation interrupted. And for the nutrition uh, indicator, we focus on a subset of what we call a target population, which consists of the poor and vulnerable people who are not yet deprived of nutrition. And we ask what would happen if 25% of, of, of that target population would actually see uh, increases in um, their, their malnutrition deprivations arising. That estimate, uh, that hypothesis is basically drawn upon estimates of the World Food Programme. And we also consider two uh, upper and lower bound scenarios. In a lower bound scenario, we consider 10% of the target population becoming deprived in nutrition. And in the upper bound, we consider 50% of the target population becoming deprived in nutrition. In all, we have six scenarios. So three of them consider only shocks in nutrition, and the other three consider those shocks in nutrition with a combined shock of school attendance as a half is back. So here I show the results for uh, what we call the moderate uh, scenario, where we have 25% of the poor and vulnerable population becoming deprived in nutrition. And then here we have, uh, the in the left uh, panel, we have uh, the effect with school attendance. And on the right, we have the one with, without school attendance. The first thing that we see is that for countries that have a low level of MPI, the simulated change in the MPI itself because of COVID tends to be relatively small. And as we consider countries that have higher levels of MPI, the effect tends to be a little bit higher. However, that relationship tends to reverse when we uh, arrive at very, very high levels of MPI. The intuition behind that result is that when the MPI is already very high, then it is likely that people will be facing already uh, problems in nutrition and school attendance. So there is little scope for the effect to act to increase poverty. Now, before going to some additional results, two things are very important in this exercise that we do here. The first thing is that all these points and all these this impacts that we simulate are uh, computed using data that is prior to 2020. And we have seen that progress has been very visible up until 2020. So we need to find a way to account for that progress. That on the one side. On the other side, we also have a lot of country specificities. So for example, for a similar level of MPI, you can see that the simulated change can actually be very, very different. So country specificities need to be taken into account in a certain way. So to overcome and to account for those two particular uh, issues that we have, what we do is we uh, model the effect uh, of COVID on MPI as a function of the level of age and the level of 
H times MPI, times A, which is effectively the MPI. This allows us to, um, to use the projected level of H and A in 2020 as predictors of the shock in 2020. But not only that, because in order to take into account country specificities, we also um, adjust that, uh, that change by a country specific uh, factor adjustment which is computed in such a way that it takes a unity value whenever we use the, the actual observed levels of H and A as predictors of the shock, so that we will uh, reproduce exactly the shock, so that is why this factor would become one in those cases. So we, do, we apply that for every country, and using UNDESA population um, figures, we aggregate all of the, the results for the 70, 70 countries that we have, because five of them don't have information on nutrition, to compute what would happen to the global aggregate of MPI. And then once we have that, we compare that result against the trend that we observed in the past for that global aggregate. So for example, here you see that if we consider the impact on nutrition in a moderate scenario with 25% of the target population becoming deprived, then we would arrive at a level of MPI that was last seen five years back in the projection. And if we, on top of that, we include the impact on school attendance on top of the nutrition impact, then we would arrive at a setback of around nine years in uh, the progress that was made in poverty reduction. So this table actually shows in more detail what is the outcome of each of the six scenarios that we consider. And we see that in the worst scenario, for example, where we have a 50% of children becoming absent, uh, becoming um, deprived in school attendance, and 50% of the target population becoming deprived in, in nutrition, then we would arrive at the, the, the figure that is featured in the report, which is more than 500 million more people living in multidimensional poverty in that worst case scenario, which basically implies a, a setback uh, of around 10 years in poverty reduction. So basically, um, we have a lot of results in terms of policy that would be uh, salient in light of this, but I would just conclude very briefly with some technical remarks. This work is a uh, work in progress. It has been possible thanks to the newly just released data set that Monica just presented, and it is very flexible in terms of, um, of, of what it allows us to do. But as I said, it is ongoing work, and we're trying to complement that analysis with some estimation um, uh, exercises, and also to take into account some kind of errors, for example, that come from the fact that we're using survey data for our analysis. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Excellent. Uh, Dean, are you still online? Yep, I sure am. Thanks. And I will share content as soon as that permission is transferred to me. Um, let me just start by saying, um, really enjoyed uh, reading the report and um, and really uh, appreciate the opportunity to comment here. Let me, oh, I still don't have permission to share yet. Katja, oh well, um, there we go. Okay, so first let me just say that my um, sort of general reaction is that this is really ambitious and daring work for obvious region, reasons projecting into the future is a tricky business and they are in a particular difficult situation of trying to project um, based off of sort of a, a relatively small database of um, as, as sort of their foundation for the projections. Um, so it's ambitious, it's daring, but it's very important work. I, I think um, what policymakers are most interested in is, is change in the things that we're trying to monitor. Are we making progress? Are we making progress at an adequate level? So I think it's really uh, laudable that they've taken this on. Um, I, I'm also was really impressed with reading the report that there was a lot of modesty in speaking about the um, the results. So they're very constrained in how they're thinking about their inferences. Um, and uh, the sort of the key inference is that half of the 75 countries for which they have um, data will be um, uh having their um their mpi levels um what it did make so that's in contrast to the pressures that i'm sure they face which was to report uh on global progress towards um having mpi 
And I think they've been very careful to not make those sort of statements. What I thought would be really useful, even in the technical report, is more discussion of the uh, countries that are missing from the coverage. So a little bit of a sense of um, what's the spatial and temporal coverage of the countries that we have? How does that contrast with the countries that we do not have? Um, in particular, there are some pretty clear patterns that are popping up in the, the diagram by uh, initial MPI level of which countries are making their progress. And so it might be useful to provide a plot and some descriptive information on those countries not included in this um, discussion. I suppose this is just an editorial and, and maybe just a bit of a, um, a poke, I suppose. But um, in a couple of places, the readers told that 47 of countries will have their MPI irrespective of the underlying model. And I thought that was maybe one case where just a slight editorial uh, comment would be merited. So it's, it's irrespective of the underlying models under consideration. And I think I'd just say that because the, the set of models that they're looking at, this constant absolute change, constant relative change, and logistic transformation, aren't all that dissimilar of modeling choices. And I'm not quite sure that that functional specification would be the area where I would uh, imagine the most sort of dispersion in my projection uh, errors uh, coming from. So maybe just a little bit of um, uh, tempering in some of the language there. Let's see if I can go forward here. Okay. Um, I thought maybe the most important sort of challenging issue, and it certainly is noted in the report, but I would argue maybe we could see just a little bit of more digging into this is that um, they're doing these projections based off of change over two points in time. Um, and I, I think a, a reader would benefit from having some sense of really how sensitive is that estimated change um, to the number of periods supporting the estimate? And how sensitive is the estimated change to the specific years selected? And so what I have in mind here is that they certainly have some countries where they have more than two years worth of data. And so you could start to imagine the question of, take a country that has say five points in time, construct every two year permutation that exists and create a, a set of essentially five factorial, I think, um, um, estimated growth rates for that country. And then report essentially what's the range of those estimated growth rates, because that will give you a little bit of a sense of um, how arbitrary is it that they're just choosing two data points or how much change would they get from the fact that they're using two data points rather than say if they had five points in time for every single country and were to take weighted averages of um, beginning and end points, how big of a difference would that uh, result in? Um, you could also imagine, um, so I noted that one of their next steps was to try to incorporate um, sampling error into this. And I think that could be useful. I'm, I'm probably a little bit less excited about that. I'm probably a little bit more concerned about projection error. And I think one thing that could be done then certainly is again, take these countries where you have multiple data points and just say, if we choose, if we have five points in time, let's choose the two earliest points look at how far off are we if we use those two to project forward onto the data points for which we do have data and then start to report that so give the reader a little bit more sense of the sensitivity to the two points in time and to the projection error that can be made uh, from that um, there's also this fact that they're choosing those two points in time at different points in time for each and every country and i did have this underlying sort of concern that um if MPI is like consumption poverty in terms of um, flows, and I think we see some evidence that it is not, but um, but I don't think that's completely definitive evidence yet. It might be worth thinking about, um, are there good global years and bad global years for MPI and start to think about decomposing the change in MPI based on um, uh, how much of that is global variation and how much is country variation. Um, and report on that a bit. Okay, and a little bit of what's driving my concern about the two points in time is this is just an old figure from um, a report we worked on based on consumption poverty. And this is essentially the 30 year trajectory of um, poverty decline in Thailand over um, over various sort of poverty lines. And, and the main point here is that Thailand happens to be quite rich in consumption-based uh, poverty measures. 
so lots and lots of different points in time. And so, um, you know, imagine that you were trying to estimate a growth rate off two different points in time, and you happen to get, unluckily, 1995 and 2000. You would get this growth rate that suggests that poverty is increasing over time. And if you project that out to 2030, you would get a very bad sort of result for Thailand. If you contrast that with having data from 2000 and 2005, you'd get a completely different result. And so the sensitivity of only having two points in time could be quite high if other countries look like Thailand, for example. So that's a little bit of driving that. This other point of choosing the, um, is thinking about the logistic. I think there's a, a lot of empirical, or no, a lot of theoretical discussion about the logistic model. And it seems to me completely reasonable selection, a completely reasonable sort of specification to choose. Um, I think though there could be a little bit more discussion for the reader to help the reader to understand what are the empirical implications of this. And it's noted, but very briefly in the paper that obviously if we're doing a logistic transformation, that means that MPI can never get to zero. And um, I think that has some interesting sort of implications in terms of thinking about this. You might start to wonder, worry a little bit about if a choice that you're making today and making projections towards 2020 or 2030 um, will affect how you think about modeling it five years from now. Will you want to worry about consistency in your projection uh, modeling choices? And if you start to think in those terms, then you might start to wonder about um, the sort of model that will provide not only good estimates at this point in time, but good estimates as you approach zero. Um, and it's not obvious to me that um, how one thinks about the question as you're approaching zero is the same as how you think about um, estimating it today. Um, I suppose on a, a, an additional coverage on that is it might be worth commenting a little bit on um, coverage and precision issues in low prevalence countries. So I think in those countries where you have very high MPI levels, which is quite a few countries, Obviously, this is not a concern, but there are several countries where the MPI is approaching zero. And so one does need to think a little bit about how well can we actually estimate um, uh, having an MPI from 3% to 1.5%. And is that really a meaningful exercise to, to undertake? Um, I'll skip those last two. A little bit of what's driving my comment about the um, this assumption of um, should we be thinking about the logistic transformation as the way to model um, poverty declines? My general sort of, I think most people's reaction is that seems perfectly reasonable. And a lot of that is driven by this notion that this is a figure of, of income uh, poverty measures. But if you look at the sketch on the right-hand side, that's just showing the, the probability density functions and the cumulative density functions of a dis hypothetical distribution of income. But it's just showing as you move from T0 to T1, so from left to right in this case, you could see a in the upper figure a large reduction in poverty. Um, but that slope at the CDF is giving you a, a rate of decline in the um, in the change in poverty level, and so that's showing a very definite and distinct deceleration of uh, the rate of poverty reduction as you're getting closer and closer to zero. And so that would be essentially an argument also in favor of the logistic model. But then there is this issue of, is that empirically founded at all? And we did a little bit of work on that, uh, looking at countries who you could claim have reached zero poverty, extreme poverty, or close to zero poverty, and looked at their trajectories as they're getting closer. And a large number of these do seem to be asymptoting towards zero or certainly are decelerating as they're approaching zero. But there certainly are plenty of exceptions to that where um, you could argue that it's fairly constant or in some cases perhaps even accelerating as it's approaching zero. Um, and so I think that would be useful to at least think about and to give the reader a little bit of guidance moving forward in this. Um, what I do want to comment on, oh, actually, I guess that's my last slide, but what was really pretty exciting for me was that I think this is a pretty interesting exercise. They put a lot of effort into constructing um, a data set that has two comparable data points in time. And so I even kind of wanted to dig in deeper to figure out, well, how did they produce that comparable data set? And sure enough, they have another methodological note talking about the, the construction of that database. And I think that's uh, incredibly amazing that that document exists. Um, 
my overall sense in reading it was that it was maybe a little bit heavy on assertions and a little bit light on evidence. Um, so we're told things like harmonization process guarantees rigorous uh, comparisons, uh, or two or more MPI estimations, estimations comparable by exactly aligning the indicator definitions. It's just sort of language that I think um, makes me uncomfortable just because I think of very little is being guaranteed in, uh, or exact in empirical work. And I just think about this sensitivity of the things that we're trying to measure to questionnaire design and even this notion of having the English translation of these questionnaires being identical doesn't mean to me at all that they are identical and how they were applied in the field. And even if the same words are used, um, it's not even clear that within cultures that they will be interpreted in exactly the same way. So just a little bit more modesty in the, some of the language and talking, talking about the comparability and the harmonization, I think would be um, um, consistent with at least the, the field work evidence of um, thinking about trying to measure the same thing in different countries or the same thing over time within the same country. Having said that, these sort of uh, studies are incredibly expensive and uh, are, are expensive and time consuming, incredibly time consuming. Um, but I think they're needed to help us understand comparability issues. And I think that's an important issue for the MPI. And this is just the last slide I will give then. I'll just say that um, a lot of these glossy reports that um, some of us are um, co-authors of uh, really have sort of large policy uh, implications and impacts. And they can be produced with or without a solid technical foundation. And really the credibility of those recommendations really hinges on the credibility of the technical work underpinning them. And I just really like to uh, laud the o OFI and UNDP and all of the funders of their work who are willing to invest in um, a set of important working paper series. Uh, they have both research in progress working paper series and they have methodological notes that document in great detail all of the assumptions that they're building and this targets a small but important sort of technical audience to read these reports. And so I think that's really impressive. And I would just like to congratulate the team on a great report and a great sort of effort in terms of transparency and documenting their findings. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dean. I believe we have Francis back on. So Francis, can you take it away? Can you hear me now? Very good. I'll give you a picture too. Okay. Um, yes, I first let me say I'm talking about the change as I have not been able to attend the whole meeting. Let me apologize because my wife, I went down in the middle and it's Katya has been very helpful, but it's back up. Okay, I'm talking about the section which is about change and I just think it's extremely impressive and useful paper and obviously represents a huge amount of work. Um, building the data and then obviously um, manipulating it. And I think it's going to be very inspiring for researchers and exceptionally useful for exploring the determinants of the change uh, in uh, the multidimensional poverty. Now, in my remarks, I want to cover um, briefly three areas, a little bit about the measures adopted, uh, something on the comparison with monetary incomes, and a little bit on research possibilities for the future. Uh, a very interesting issue is how to measure change. Um, because as the paper shows, there are many different ways of uh, measuring it and you get very different answers. Um, two which are, are predominant is, are the absolute rate of change and the relative rate of change. And the absolute rate of change, which is the difference between the initial and the later MPI, um, is not sensitive to the initial level. So a reduction, say, from 75% to 70% in one country would be the same, would qualify in the same way, get the same results, as a reduction in another country from 10% to 5%. Well, the relative rate of change, of course, is totally sensitive to the initial level. So if one takes these two countries, in the first country, um, it would seem that it does much, much less well than the second country, because the first country, the improvement is just 0.7%, quite small. 
even though in fact in terms of the absolute reduction in poverty it's the same and in the other country finds that it has a 50 percent improvement so look you get very diametrically different results um and the two measures obviously produce the same answers if you start at the same point but if you don't start at the same point you get very different answers and you need to think about why you should use one or the other we found very much the same problem when we were looking at how to identify progress in human development in terms of the human development index and which were the best performers and which were the worst performers and exactly the same issues arose and you could find very different uh, improvements and what we did then was to classify countries into groups, the low, middle, and upper human development index. And I think it might be something to be said for doing the same for poverty. Uh, in other words, comparing the countries all with high poverty and what was their progress, the countries with middle poverty and the countries with low poverty. And I feel that that comparison is in a way much fairer because that's where countries start from. They start from a particular position what policies can they put into effect if they've got 75% poverty in their country? Very different from the policies you'd want to put into effect if you had 0.9% poverty in your country, which in fact some of the countries covered do have as low poverty as that. And I'm not sure that it makes much sense really to compare uh, the 0.9% and the 75% in terms of um, certainly in terms of policy, but in terms of achievements either, because it's just so very different. Obviously, a country with only 0.9 can't make an improvement of 5%. Uh, on the other hand, a country with 75% poverty, it's a big achievement to make an improvement of 5%, uh, and one should give them some credit. Um, so we need to think of what we want to measure. And let's think about the research on the determinants of poverty, which for me, an absolute measure makes most sense, um, and the change should be related to that. Um, and yet, at the same time, we don't want to penalise the countries and say they're no good because they've already got very low rates of poverty. We want to explore the policies which enable them initially to get there and then to sustain such low rates of poverty. So that suggests that one needs to research not only the rate of change, but also um, what determines the absolute level of poverty. So both are necessary in research. When we're talking about comparisons with changes in monetary income poverty, again, one could use either measure as long as the monetary poverty one is using the same. That is to say, monetary poverty also can be thought of in absolute and relative terms and the same issues arise. But you could, of course, get very odd results if uh, the levels of monetary poverty differ a lot from the levels of um, uh, multidimensional poverty in the same country. So that's going to cause complications. Well, there are other measures, many other measures which are mentioned in the paper. Mainly they're important additional measures. One doesn't need to have a choice, make a choice. Clearly, um, a change in the intensity and a change in the vulnerability are both very important complementary measures. Um, I just make a, a brief point about vulnerability. I mean, the vulnerability basically is uh, a very useful addition. The population which are not poor, but vulnerable to poor poverty because they're nearly there, so to speak. Um, but it doesn't necessarily capture vulnerability to all situations because some situations the vulnerability may arise even with quite well-off people. And I think this COVID has illustrated that because uh, quite a people with um, established jobs suddenly find themselves without jobs. And if they don't have insurance and so on, uh, unemployment insurance or any sort of support, they're very vulnerable. Uh, similarly, if you're suddenly subject to an earthquake, you're vulnerable um, more or less irrespective of where you were initially. Uh, usually the poor are more vulnerable, but not always. So I think one can say, yes, you've got an important measure there with vulnerability, but I think you need to think uh, a little bit more about the, the nature of vulnerability to different types of shock. 